Welcome to this Cronkite News Special. I'm Chloe Nordquist. Thanks for joining us. Our Cronkite News reporters strive to make an impact in covering education in Arizona. Tonight, a look at challenges facing schools across Arizona and the creative ways teachers are finding solutions and inspiring children in the classroom. A school voucher program that was once offered to just a select few students could soon expand to at least half of all kids in Arizona. The Senate bill has already passed and is now awaiting and is now in the House awaiting a vote. Cronkite News reporter Amanda Kukula explains how this could impact our schools. The point of clarification, I think, is that nobody disagrees, at least that I know of, with the idea of ESAs, that there are some kids that really can't be best served in a traditional public schools. And ESAs were intended to be for them, and it's great that they can avail themselves of that to get a really specialized education. Senate Bill 1279 would expand the eligibility for the voucher program, also known as empowerment scholarship accounts. If the bill passes, it would grant vouchers to nearly half of all Arizona school students, allowing them to attend private or charter schools with taxpayer dollars. The sponsor of the bill, Debbie Lesko, says that this bill isn't intended to hurt public schools. It's simply meant to be used as an alternative. It gives 90 percent of the funding of what the public school would have received and it gives the money to the parent so the parent can use that money for other educational choices for their student. But it won't cover the entire tuition cost, causing some to be concerned only wealthy families would be able to take advantage of the program and that there won't be enough accountability. So a parent gets a debit card with the equivalent of 90 percent of what the state would normally pay in base level funding and takes that card and is just supposed to give their kids an education. And without any accountability, we've already seen that the system gets abused. The average scholarship amount is $5,400. And 2016 Arizona School Teacher of the Year, Christine Marsh, knows that that's not enough to cover tuition for private schools. Let's get public school funding in general up to an adequate level so that all kids' needs can be met appropriately instead of funneling money out to kids who can afford, whose families can afford to then send them somewhere else. It's up to the House of Representatives to take action on this bill. In Phoenix, Amanda Kukula, Cronkite News. The House delayed that vote yesterday and is expected to take action in the next two weeks. The transition from military life to college life is different for every person. That's why one of the Arizona Veteran Centers are so important. Cronkite News reporter Sydney Glenn found out what Arizona State University does for veterans and the man who's inspired so many. We want a real experience, not a DMV experience here. A veteran center on a college campus isn't out of the ordinary, but director Steve Borden says what the Pat Tillman Veteran Center has to offer certainly is. We know that a student who's engaged on campus has a much higher likelihood of succeeding. And so to dedicate staff to help veterans find a niche where they can be engaged on campus is, uh, is something that we have that I feel is unique. In addition to the standard Veteran Center duties, the Tillman Center also offers jobs to student veterans and helps them transition. This is the first time for me to get a job outside the military, so I don't know what to expect. But once I started working here, I started meeting new people, uh, networking with people, hanging out on the weekends, you know, just getting to know other veterans. I, I felt real good. While also paying tribute to the inspirational namesake, number 42, Pat Tillman, who in 2004 died while serving his country. Not only was he an exemplary athlete, an exemplary in his service to our country, but he was an incredible student. I love what he stands for. I'm not a big football fan, but understanding that he joined the military, and he's also, you know, was an NFL player, I mean, that says a lot about him. Beyond veterans, the Pat Tillman Center supports active duty military and family members. In Tempe, Sydney Glenn, Cronkite News. Arizona State University has a Pat Tillman Veterans Center on each of its four campuses where they serve more than 4,000 people a semester. With a continuing teacher shortage in Arizona, districts are forced to find new ways to get teachers in the classroom. Cronkite News reporter Amanda Kukula shows us how districts are trying to sell themselves to new teachers. Thank you. The two words students say to sum up the appreciation for their teacher. But the appreciation doesn't seem to be enough. The need for teachers is growing in Arizona. 
The Anderson Preparatory Academy is just one of many schools across the valley that's had to struggle to fill positions. This industry is very hard to hire. Adriana Brannon, the director of the academy, says with class enrollment higher than before, the want for more teachers has turned into a need. In having a family with three children, Adriana understands why hiring has been so difficult. There's no benefits. There's, and, and that's really hard, especially for a family to not get any kind of benefits. They don't offer anything. It's, and the pay is really, really low. With these drawbacks, teachers have been leaving Arizona to Midwestern states with higher pay. A study by teachingdegree.org found average salaries in Minnesota are up to $20,000 more than in Arizona. The, the problem with teachers leaving the classroom after just a few years is, is a problem all across the state. So Brannon and her staff have turned to new ways to recruit and retain. The Academy has hired nearly a third of their staff by using social media and other online sites. And with applicants being able to send a quick resume through email or scan an application with the click of a button, the Academy says that the hiring process has been a lot easier and quicker. We just put ads out everywhere we can. Go to Craigslist, we just went through Indeed. Um, we just have to have six months of experience at least and you know fingerprint card high school diploma tv tests and just love to be around kids be around kids help them learn and hopefully remain in arizona in phoenix amanda kukula cronkite news books are something many of us take for granted but literacy advocates say in low-income communities there is only one book for every 300 kids Cronkite News reporter Lauren Michaels shows us how companies are getting involved to change that. They're called Little Free Libraries and they're popping up across the valley with about 30 already registered. Local companies are getting involved to help increase that number by the end of the year. At first glance, it may seem like another woodworking project, but for Phoenix high school teacher Don Krug, building his own little free library means so much more because of his firsthand experience. The kids come into school and because they haven't had the exposure to books and they haven't been read to, uh, they come in below where they should be at for comprehension. This is Krug's way of making a change outside his classroom. As a teacher, you're always trying to reach out. And like I said earlier, th this is an opportunity to reach out to a whole different group of kids. And I get to do it through my hobby. It's like it's a win, win, win. Krug found out about the project from where he buys his supplies. The local wood supply company is among many helping to build community libraries. Woodworker Source is a family-owned business, which let customers know about the Little Free Library project by creating a competition. This gives them a chance to build something for our community at large that other people can enjoy, thousands of people can enjoy throughout the entire year. Southwest Human Development, a nonprofit here in the Valley, has helped enlist the local support of PetSmart, Shutterfly, and others to give children easy access to books. What we're seeing is kids showing up in kindergarten unprepared to learn. They don't have those basic early literacy skills that are so important. The goal? To build 100 little free libraries by the end of this year. We actually have a little kit uh, that these organizations use as a team building opportunity and a way to give back. Every single library that's come back has been its own unique piece of, uh, almost piece of artwork. Once a little free library is complete, it's placed in a neighborhood like this one. Fully stocked with books, children can take one or return one. Krug has already donated his little wooden library. Literacy is just so extremely important for people to be successful in the world. I just feel so fortunate. I am where I am today because I know how to read. And there are more than 36,000 little free libraries around the world. You can check out our story on cronkitenews.azpbs.org to see if there's a registered library near you. Lauren Michaels, Cronkite News. As digital music technology continues to advance, the possibilities are endless for musicians to create new and exciting audio experiences. But Cronkite News reporter Audrey Wheel shows us that digital music is about more than just sound. New to Arizona State University, Professor Lauren Hayes brought with her the practice of multisensory music, which means adding visuals and movement to digital sound to create an all-encompassing experience for both performers and listeners. Nothing is as it seems for Professor Lauren Hayes. 
That's because anything can be an instrument. I got this for about $8. It's just a generic controller. All part of her work to create a multi-sensory music experience with digital sound. When I started performing with laptops, I would just click a button and hear this loud sound. And there was no correlation between the physical energy and the sounds that I were he was hearing. So I started to look at ways to find meaning in my actions and the sounds that I was producing. This may look like an ordinary couch, but it's actually vibrating to the sensations of the music playing in the room. It's just one of Hayes's many multi-sensory projects. She also built her own music software connected to that video game controller, wears an armband that receives audio feedback while she's performing, and improvises with a ball called an alpha sphere made of elastic pads. Instruments that look much different from the classical piano she grew up playing. But Hayes says it's not that far off. As anyone who plays an instrument knows, you make use of constantly sensory feedback that you get through your body. So whether it's the force that you have to press a violin string or the vibrations you get through piano keys, uh, which constantly inform the performer of how to make their next sound. In addition to being able to translate that sound to an audience or even other performers. And she's teaching these ideas to the next generation of digital musicians. As a, a musician, is and especially like an electronic uh, musician, it's really cool to get like to know the history of like digital sound and how um, electronic sound has evolved, and all the different things that have come out of it. Musicians all over the world are working on similar technologies. Prior to coming to ASU, Hayes worked in the UK, using her instruments to bring music to people with sensory impairments, learning difficulties, and autism. In the media center, Audrey Wheel, Cronkite News. A local nonprofit is shaking things up in schools. I got to spend some time with the Be Kind People Project and learn how they're getting students on their feet to stop bullying. What does hip hop have to do with bullying? They hear don't do this, don't, don't, don't. And we just believe that we can give them the same message, but give it to them in a positive way. You'll never hear them use the word bully in an assembly. But the Be Kind People Project is using hip-hop to stop bullying in its tracks. Give them that wow factor at first so we can gain those cool points, so we make sure that they're going to listen to us. Based out of Arizona, they travel from school to school, recognizing teachers and teaching students to be kind. When we tell principals ahead of time that that might happen, a lot of times they're like, but you're going to get them all on their feet, moving around at once, like there's no way. But sure enough, the Be Kind crew makes it happen. Even Superintendent Diane Douglas stopped by to see how the Be Kind crew is making a difference. To see them share that enthusiasm with our children, you know, they can grow up to be whatever they want and follow their own dreams, and it all starts here with very positive messages. When you see the look on the kids' faces and the teachers' faces, and they realize this is something that's so simple, but yet is something that is so impactful. Ultimately, they show kids that thanking teachers is important. And being kind is being cool. Even though they're based out of Arizona, the Be Kind People Project is taking their message national. The crew is now traveling to spread kindness across schools in America. Arizona's top spellers met for a showdown in Phoenix, and Cronkite News reporter Gilbert Cordova met with one contestant as she geared up to hopefully take home a big win. Good afternoon, and welcome to the Arizona Educational Foundation's 2016 Arizona Spelling Bee. I'm and so it began with the final 27 best young spellers eagerly awaiting to be the last one to the mic to represent the state. B-A-B-A -B -A, Baba. And so was the case for Nicola Ferguson, a 7th grader from Sunrise Middle School in Scottsdale. Her preparation for such a task was a bit unusual. I didn't really study as much as I did in previous years because I have more to do now that I'm in middle school. But Nicola had a lot of competition. May I have the organ, please? Spellers came and went as the bee went on for hours, as words that seemed easy enough were sometimes the most tricky. Am I saying this right, Bambino? Sounds correct. Parents sat nervously in the crowd, hoping not to hear that daunting. I think it's hardest in the first couple of rounds. You're very nervous, but as it goes on, uh, you calm down. And that's exactly what happened as Nicola approached the final round. Recumbent. R-E-C-U-M-B-E-N-T. 
correct. And with that swift spelling of recumbent in the 17th round of the B, Nicola won. I'm still really surprised that I did manage to win it. I wasn't expecting this at all. That's very exciting. I mean, think about a couple hundred thousand kids and she finished it on the top. It's still hard to fathom. Also hard to fathom? The big prize means Nicola has to do it all over again, and this time at the Scripps National Spelling Bee in W A S H I N G T O N D C. In downtown Phoenix, Gioba Cordova, Cronkite News. A broadcast of the 2016 Arizona Spelling Bee will air April 20th at 9 p.m. here on Arizona PBS. With tax day quickly approaching, are you still looking to receive money back from the state? Reporter Sydney Glenn found out how you can earn a tax credit and help underprivileged Valley schools. Mayor Greg Stannon stopped by the Uptown Wednesday Market in Phoenix today to serve up some free coffee and to inform people about the Kids Are Missing Out campaign. Retail politics at its best. Free coffee, a sales pitch, and a handshake from the mayor. The after school enrichment programs are some of the best educational experiences a kid can have, and we can only do it if it's funded. Out at the farmer's market promoting the Kids Are Missing Out campaign, a dollar for dollar tax reduction that helps fund schools' extracurricular programs. Classrooms are not a social place, but after school activities where you get with your peers, your friends, tremendous, tremendous engagement in our school systems. The goal of the campaign is to help what they call the most deserving of school districts receive more tax credit donations. Look, those kids in those classrooms, that's our future. And so after school enrichment is one of the best ways to make sure that they have the best overall educational experience. For more information and to see the full list of those targeted school districts, visit kidsaremissingout.org. In the Broadcast Center, I'm Sydney Glenn, Cronkite News. In Arizona, Native Americans have the lowest graduation rate of all ethnicities. It's one of many reasons why State Senator Carlisle Begay was in Washington this week, saying change is absolutely necessary. Cronkite News reporter Lauren Clark in our Washington Bureau has the details of a plan he's urging Congress to pass. When Arizona State Senator Carlisle Begay asked a student on the Navajo Nation what he wanted to do one day. The student said, why does it matter and why do you care? This despair, Begay says, is a product of being abandoned by the government for generations. And nowhere is this more evident than in the education system. In fact, half of Native American students attending a federally run school in Arizona never receive their high school diploma. And we should look at options to give them an alternative. An alternative like Senator McCain's proposal. It allows Native American students to use federal dollars to attend any school of their choice, including private schools, online curricula, and even tutors. Why should students attending federally funded schools not have the option to be empowered, not have the option to have better quality options available to them? But this bill isn't without its critics. Some worry it will severely hurt funds for those Bureau of Indian Education schools if students choose to leave. And... The other issue is that, you know, a, not, a number of our schools are in remote locations. Making it difficult for students to even find another school within their area. Still, Begay argues the status quo is not acceptable. And today it is time for us to explore what is education today in our Native American communities? In Washington, Lauren Clark, Cronkite News. For nearly a century, Phoenix Indian School functioned as a federally run boarding school for Native American children, separating them from their families and culture in an effort to assimilate them to Euro-American society. It's a piece of history that's been locked up. But as Cronkite News reporter Audrey Wheel shows us, that's about to change. The doors to this Phoenix Indian School building have been closed to the public for 26 years, but this time next year, they'll be open to everyone when the site is restored as a cultural center. Steel Indian School Park is still and quiet now, but the new center hopes to bring back a vibrancy that hasn't existed since the school was open. It's going to be a high school reunion, um, supersized. And the main goal? To look back and to acknowledge that painful past, but then also realize that we can come back to this spot and make it our own, have events here that will celebrate who we are. Plans include a gallery where visitors can learn of an era when segregating Native American children was seen as the best way to assimilate them. 
Native American Connections is leading the project, with much of the funding coming from the city of Phoenix, which owns the land. We get 80,000 people here for Fourth of July, and to them it's just a park. But with an active facility showing the history of the Indian school, there's an opportunity for those, those 80,000 people and more to see that, no, this is more than just a grass space. And for some, it's personal. This has been home for generations of Native American families. Patty Talahongva would know. In 1978, she was a student here. And years earlier, her grandmother attended the school. When we come back as alumni, we're walking in a park, yes, but we're also walking in our old neighborhood. An old neighborhood with new purpose. We can enjoy ourselves here and make it what we want it to be and educate ourselves in the way we want to be educated and um, pass on our traditions, our language, our um, cultures. Construction is now fully funded and set to begin this summer, but Native American Connections is still seeking funds for the interior. In Phoenix, Audrey Wheel, Cronkite News. A local high school robotics team is headed to the World Championships. I caught up with Cactus High's Cobra Commanders to see how they are gearing up for the big dance. You can feel the excitement when the Cobra Commanders qualified for the World Championships in March. It was I don't know, it was amazing. It was an amazing experience. The last time lead mentor Adam Scheuer went to Worlds was 16 years ago when he founded the team. They learn everything from problem solving to, to just working as a team and all sorts of things. So I wanted to give the students the same opportunity that I had. The team's robot, the Little Shredder, beat out 52 teams at a regional qualifier in Flagstaff. I played sports and I would honestly say driving the robot's almost more intense. The Cobra Commanders often stay until 10 p.m. six days a week at Cactus High in Glendale preparing for competitions. The kids worked really, really, really hard. We had late nights, long hours, um, and we went back to basics. We really simplified everything. Even after all of their hard work, the team was still shocked to actually take home a win. It's almost surreal. like it didn't really happen. Cody and Curtis have been on the robotics team since freshman year and are both pursuing STEM careers at Arizona universities in the fall. Now that the commanders have qualified for the world championships being held in St. Louis at the end of the month, they're using competitions between now and then to tweak a couple things, try new strategies, and enjoy themselves. But when asked if they think they'll win at Worlds... Oh, no. <laughs> and in all seriousness, uh, we're a really small team. We definitely don't have the funding that a lot of these teams have, but we're definitely going to try our best. We're really excited to go. If you want to help out the Cobra Commanders, get to the World Championships in St. Louis. They are still accepting donations on their GoFundMe page. The link is GoFundMe.com slash Cobra Commanders. In January, Arizona became the first state to require high school students to take the civics test. Cronkite News reporter Alexis Dominguez gives us a look into how a Valley teen is helping students pass. Riley Danler designed the Arizona High School Citizen app. I actually had zero experience with building an app, but I had some experience with programming from a class in high school. The 16-year-old began developing the app by designing the questions. The questions are from the actual citizenship test, and uh, I edited them to make them like multiple choice questions because most of them were you actually had to write down a full answer, so I developed some answers. The game is fun and interactive, and you can even make it competitive playing against friends or even strangers. The game features eight sections where you can learn about the 1800s and geography. According to Law for Kids, high schools all over the state are now using this app. I, I feel great, honestly. It's, <laughs> we worked very hard on it. It was, and I'm glad that it's actually helping people. Now, McDonald's is supporting the project. High school students who complete each section of the app can earn a free Egg McMuffin. Now that like McDonald's is going through and promoting the app, it's definitely going to get, get to more students and it's going to help them pass. And he thinks that will get students to download and play. Oh yeah, everybody's, everybody wants free food. Riley wants to build on his success with the citizenship app and he plans to go to college to become a programmer. The app is available on the Apple App Store and Riley hopes to make the app available to other devices in the near future. In the Broadcast Center, Alexis Dominguez, Cronkite News. 
Tonight, we continue our Veterans Coming Home series. For 12 years, the Veterans Heritage Project has connected students with veterans in Arizona. And yesterday, an event in Cave Creek brought the project back to its beginnings. Cronkite News reporter Audrey Wheel attended the event to see what the project is all about and how it continues to grow. I've spent majority of my 20s preparing for a combat zone in a combat zone or recovering from a combat zone. Chief Warrant Officer Rose Maddy was one of four veterans who shared their stories at Cactus Shadows High School, the same school where the Veterans Heritage Project originated more than a decade ago. Students and vets together is a magic combination. Retired teacher Barbara Hatch founded the project when she noticed an interest among her students after they watched the movie Saving Private Ryan. 20 schools later, the project has raised awareness of not only what veterans have done, but also who they are. Now you have veterans who are students at college, you have veterans who are parents, veterans are teachers, veterans are in our community so much and people don't know to ask their questions and are afraid to ask. Maddie has done three combat tours, two in Iraq and one in Afghanistan and now so serves part-time in the National Guard when she's not home with her son. Having the students come up afterwards and saying that, you know, they liked hearing my story and they liked hearing a woman's perspective, it really, it motivates me. And the students yeah, also benefit. Ridiculous. It kind of like teaches all of us that like, even though we have fears, it's important for us to overcome it and involve other people in like the struggle that we've experienced because they can help us more than we think they can. In addition to holding events, each year the project publishes a book of veteran interviews. The good thing is, if it all ended tomorrow, there are 1,200 stories at the Library of Congress in D.C. that are permanently archived. That many veterans, that many young people's lives have been touched. The next book will focus on women in combat and include an interview with Officer Maddie. In Cave Creek, Audrey Wheel, Cronkite News. That's it for Cronkite News tonight. We are proud to be the news division of Arizona PBS. For top Arizona stories anytime, go to cronkitenews.azpbs.org.